so in, in my somewhat long career now in philosophy and in physics, I've never worked on the measurement problem. Um, it always struck me as too hard. I think none of the inter interpretations of quantum mechanics uh, suffices to my mind to deal with it. And indeed, I've tried my hardest to avoid anything to do with quantum mechanics my entire career. I've spent my entire career working you know, most, mostly in general relativity, you know, statistical and thermal, statistical mechanics and thermodynamics, classical mechanics. And just in the past few years, I've been, been forced to deal with quantum mechanics because of my interest in black hole thermodynamics and semi-classical gravity and quantum gravity. And so I'm now being forced, finally, much against my will, being dragged kicking and screaming to confront the measurement problem. And in my gut, I think the reason why, it's, at least to my mind, we've had very little, if any, success in dealing with it is because I, I feel like there's something about the idea of interaction as a concept that is, I take it to be a superset of measurement. However, it is that measurement is going to be characterized. There's something about this idea that we're getting fundamentally wrong in the, in the same way that physicists, that everyone was fundamentally wrong about the nature of time and in particular about the concept of simultaneity before Einstein. I feel like we're, we're waiting for our Einstein to come along and tell us how to reconceptualize interaction. And in order, um, I, I, in order perhaps to motivate why I feel this way, well, in order to, mo in order to motivate to you that my feeling this way actually may be, may be somewhat justified, I think is a better way of saying it. Um, I'm going to draw out and make precise some differences in the mathematical representations of interaction and evolution in classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, um, and begin to draw some conceptual lessons from that analysis. I wanna emphasize, I am not going to propose anything remotely like a solution to the measurement problem. I don't think we're anywhere near anywhere near doing anything like that. I'm rather going to suggest a different way of looking at it, a different way of trying to approach it, um, an attempt to reconceptualize what a good answer to it might look like. And just to let you know where I'm going, because it's going to be a it's going to be a very I'm going to cover a lot of ground in this talk. I'm going to try and do a lot, try and tell you a lot of things. So I um, just to orient you, the outline of the talk in some in somewhat detailed form is I will show you that in classical and by that I mean really Newtonian mechanics a mechanics governed by something like Newton's second law and in Lagrangian mechanics the intrinsic structure of the dynamics itself uh, naturally distinguishes um, gives one a natural characterization of the notions of character of interaction and evolution as naturally distinguished from each other mathematically, physically, and conceptually. That yields a natural distinction between configuration and momentum types of, of quantities. That in turn yields a natural characterization of what one means of what it means for a system to be in free evolution, to be isolated, to experience no interaction. It then turns out, um, to my mind, somewhat remarkably, something I realized not too long ago that this actually allows one to completely re to reconstruct the entirety of, cl of uh, classical neo-Newtonian neo space-time geometry, just from the structure of the dynamics alone. It turns out then from all of this, one can make precise the sense in which in Newtonian and Lagrangian mechanics, there is a clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from its environment's degrees of freedom. Hamiltonian mechanics, the situation is really quite different. There's no natural distinction, I claim, between interaction and, and evolution. No, no natural distinction that's intrinsic to the structure of the, that the structure of the, of the dynamics by itself gives you. Thus, there's no natural distinction between configuration and momentum. There's no natural characterization of free evolution. There's no construction no uh, of the space-time geometry, no a priori relation of the dynamics of the space-time geometry. Nonetheless, there still is in a qualified sense a, a clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from the, from the environments. In a, in a sense, I, 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 will, I can make precise. In quantum mechanics, I will conclude, there is no natural distinction between interaction and evolution intrinsic to the dynamics, no natural distinction between configuration and momentum. 
no natural characterization of a free evolution, no construction from the dynamics, no a priori relation of, of the dynamics to the space time, underlying space-time geometry, and no clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from its environment. Quantum mechanics is as utterly non-classical as mechanics can be, probably not surprisingly. And after I run, after I lead you through all of these steps, I will then finish the talk. I'll conclude with a few remarks about where I think, if I'm right about all of this, where it leads us with regard to the measurement problem and attempting to perhaps reconceive what the are uh, what what appropriate notions of dynamics, evolution, and interaction may be in the context of quantum mechanics. So let's start with these ideas in the context of Newtonian and Lagrangian mechanics. So by a classical system, what I mean is something that is appropriately and adequately represented by a space of states that is an even dimensional differential manifold. The evolution is governed by Newton's second law. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. In particular, there's a, there, on this manifold, the dynamical evolutions of the system are represented by vector fields, you know, solutions to differential equations. And there's a, a certain algebraic structure that accrues to that family of vector fields that encodes the fact that the evolution is governed by Newton's second law. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. Interact by, what I mean by interaction is applying an external force to the system, like an intervention, if you like. It turns out in a natural way, um, those are represented by vector fields on the manifold on the space of states as well. And it turns out that there is a distinguished, a distinguished vector field, the free evolution vector field, the vector field representing the evolution of the system when it's in isolation, when no external forces are imposed on it. So this is Newton's second law for a free particle written in somewhat unusual form, but I claim logically equivalent to it. You have, if you like, two equations of motion, one for the x uh, quantity, the, which but, but right now I'm not, I'm not gonna call it position or configuration. It just, turn, it just turns out, well, no, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the whole conceptual ring rule. It, it, it'll, it'll, take me, it'll take me too long to, to describe. So let's just say, for, we know it's a free particle. We know it has these two um, the equations of motion for its two quantities. So the full, the full dynamical equations are two first order linear um, linked differential equations, x dot equals v, v dot equals zero. The dynamical vector field that represents the evolution then have in, the, um, in the, uh, the components of it, in the coordinates on the tangent bundle naturally induced by the, by the coordinate systems X and V on the space of states is V comma zero. The component of the, of the dynamical vector field has uh, in the X direction has component V and in the V direction it has component zero. It's not accelerating. There's no change in V. If I turn an interaction on, say I hit my I hit I hit my particle with a stick. X dot v doesn't change. That equation of motion, if you like, for that quantity doesn't change. But the equation for v dot does change. I now stick an f stick on the right hand side, and the dynamic vector field is different. It's it still has it's this the first component of the dynamic vector field is the same. It's still v. Only the second component changes. The uh, I, I'm ignoring mass. I'm ignoring mass. By the way, just set it equal to one. And only the second component changes. And in fact, that may, I take I claim this makes it clear how to represent it, the interaction, the intervening on the system, my, my hitting it with a stick by a vector field on the space of states. The interaction vector field is just zero f stick because that's the vector field I have to add to the original vector field, the original dynamical vector field to yield the vector field that represents the, the, the particle moving with the interaction turned on. So to sum up, dynamical evolution is represented by a vector field that always has V for the component of the del del x part, 
Can you all see the um, the mouse, the, the cursor I'm moving around? So no matter what interaction I turn on, the only x dot x dot always equals v. But v dot, the component the, the v dot component depends on what force I'm turning on, what, what interaction I'm turning on, what force I'm imposing on the system. So the interaction then is represented by a vector field that always has zero for the component of the del, del x part. The interaction vector field points only in velocity-like directions, if you like. It's an acceleration. It's an instantaneous change in velocity, not in position. Any magnitude of force in any direction can be applied to any system in principle. I can hit, I can hit the particle with as big a stick as I like, as, you know, as sharply as I like in any direction that I like. And I can even hit it with two sticks at the same time. Well, in multiple simultaneously applied forces, I discover some vectorially. So this allows me now to give you a somewhat more precise definition of what I mean by a classical system. A classical system is fully characterized by the fact that its base of states is an even dimensional manifold. The family of interaction vector fields has the structure of a vector space. If I add, because adding any two of these guys still, get, still leaves me zero in the first slot, and there's some value of f in the second slot. But again, assuming I can hit it with as big a stick as I want to, as sharply as I want to, in any direction I want to, I can get any value of f I want to. So all the interaction vector fields form a vector space. And the family of dynamic vector fields has the structure of an affine space modeled on the vector space of dynamical vector fields. Recall, loosely speaking, crudely speaking, that a, a, an affine space is a space such that all, every two points of it are, um, are connected by a vector from some vector space. So, in a, uh, so if I, I, in an affine space, it makes sense to subtract two elements, but not to add them. And subtracting any two elements gives you an element in the vector space that the affine space is modeled on. And that's what happens here. I can take any two dynamical vector fields, like the free one and this one, I can subtract them, and I always get the interaction, I always get an interaction vector field. In, in fact, I get the interaction vector field that takes me from the one evolution to the other. And the fully characterized here is justified by the theorem I'm, I'm going to state in a moment. So I claim that this is obvious, as I just went through from the formulation of Newton's second law I gave you and the representations of the dynamical and the, interac and the interaction vector fields. Uh, this just more or less says what I've already said. But notice now that I needn't have actually defined from the start what was configuration and what was velocity. If, all I, if I just give you the the family of all dynamical vector fields and the family of all interaction vector fields and the algebraic structures on them, the fact that the one is an affine space modeled on the vector space of the other. By that, all, that by itself allows me to tell you which quantities in the space of states are configuration quantities and which quantities are velocity quantities. The, config, the velocity quantities are the ones that uh, the, conf the configuration quantities are the ones that don't change in the interaction vector field directions. So I get just from the structure of the dynamics alone, the algebraic, the, the, the algebraic structure on these families of vector fields that encodes the fact that these guys obey Newton's second law. I can tell you what configurations are, are configuration and what configurations are velocity. I can then tell you what, which is the distinguished free dynamical vector field. It's the one that's distinguished by the fact that only the configuration like quantities change. And I can, I, I'm speaking very loosely here because I don't have time to, I don't have time to go through everything precisely and rigorously, but this can be, a, be made all precise and rigorous. And not only for finite dimensional systems as I've been talking about, but in fact for infinite dimensional spaces of states, say for classical fields as well. And so the way to think about this conceptually is that the family of possible interactions allows one to distinguish configuration from velocity in a principled way. The interactions directly modify the system's evolutions only in velocital directions, their generalized accelerations. The physical meaning of configuration is that those quantities encode the possible interactions a system can have with its environment because they're the ones that don't change under, under, under interaction. 
And it turns out in a precise sense, velocity quantities are always dynamical derivatives of configuration ones, where by derivative, I mean in the technical sense of a derivation that's defined by the affine structure on the family of dynamical vector fields. So there's an asymmetric relationship between the configuration quantities and the velocity quantities. That's in fact is exactly what allows me to distinguish them based on the intrinsic structure of the dynamics alone. The theorem that sums all this up is given a classical system with space of states S and families of vector fields D and I with the algebraic structures on them. One can reconstruct the system's configuration space um, from the space of state space in the affine structure of the dynamical vector fields. One can then show that in fact, the space of states is canonically isomorphic to the tangent bundle over the constructed configuration space. And by canonically isomorphic, I mean that there is a distinguished isomorphism between them defined by the distinguished free dynamical vector field. The, under that isomorphism, the dynamical vector fields are just isomorphic to the family of vector fields on the tangent bundle that represent all possible solutions to the euler lagrange equation. They're the kind of second order vector fields. They're vector fields you get by lifting vector fields on configuration space to the tangent bundle by the natural lift operation. The interaction vector fields are isomorphic to the family of vector fields on the tangent bundle that represent the generalized forces. So the vertical vector fields, the one that points straight up and down the fibers, i.e. they change only the velocity quantities instantaneously. And in particular, the vertical vector fields have the structure of a vector space and the second order vector fields have the structure of an affine space modeled on it. So Lagrangian mechanics, it turns out, has exactly and all and only the structure of the, class, of the classical system that is characterized by obeying Newton's second law. And it turns out that one can do the converse as well. If one has, um, if, if, I, if I just give you a manifold and I give you an, an operator that maps scalar fields to a family of vector fields that has, that has the appropriate algebraic structure, then in fact, I can reconstruct. So if I, if I tell you how to solve the euler lagrange equation on that manifold, then I, then I can reconstruct everything. I can, I, can re, I can tell you how that manifold is diffeomorphic to a tangent bundle. I can you know, reconstruct configuration space. I can define the canonical isomorphism between the original manifold and, configure, and the tangent bundle of configuration space. I get everything. So there's a sense in which Lagrangian mechanics is incredibly rigid in a way that Hamiltonian mechanics is not. Hamiltonian mechanics infamously can be done, if you like, on any symplectic manifold. Any even dimensional orientable manifold has a symplectic structure. And a symplectic structure is all I need to define, to formulate Hamilton's equation. I don't need it to be a cotangent bundle in order to do Hamiltonian mechanics. I need the manifold to be a tangent bundle in order to do, or to do, to do Lagrangian mechanics. So to sum up, Lagrangian mechanics defines and enforces configuration and velocity and the difference between them, the fixed kinematical relation between them. The latter is the dynamical derivative of, of the former. In a sense, and in, in fact, once you move to the tangent bundle, um, the, it, uh, the, the, same relationship of, the same relationship as you've had in the kind of uh, abstract Newtonian case applies. Uh, in this, the velocity quantities were derivations of the configuration quantities, the derivation given by the, um, by the affine space structure on the family of dynamical vector fields. And on the tangent model, there's a, there's a natural affine structure that gives you a derivation as well that, again, defines the velocity quantities as the dynamical derivatives of the configuration quantities. You get an, a, a notion of interaction that's distinct from dynamical evolution, and you have a distinguished notion of isolation. So if I know only the space of states as an abstract manifold, and I know how to solve the Euler-Lagrange equation, I can reconstruct everything else. The dynamics by itself automatically defines each of and codes the difference between configuration and velocity and correlatively between evolution and interaction and uniquely de determines the notion of isolation, free evolution. So this is what I mean by a classical system. Um, that, there's, that there is a mathematical and conceptual distinction between the configuration and velocity that's encoded intrinsically in the dynamics itself. 
um, that there's an, a mathematical and conceptual distinction between evolution and interaction that's encoded in the different spin configuration of velocity. One can go either way. One can start with configuration of velocity and define evolution and interaction, or one can start with evolution and interaction and define configuration of velocity. And there's a naturally distinguished free evolution. And also, it turns out, I can now tell you what I mean by saying that there's a clean separation between a system's degrees of freedom and those of its environment. No matter what the interaction is, I can determine the system's evolution without knowing any details about the environment's degrees of freedom or about the environment's evolution. I treat the environment like a black box and everything that's relevant is encoded in the interaction vector field. I don't, I don't have to know anything about the, the environment in order to model the interaction. All I need to know is just how to write down the interaction vector field on the space of states. And it's just as an aside, um, I, talking to Don Howard a couple of years ago, I realized that, um, that one can actually think of this as a way to reconstruct uh, Don's own views on Bohr's notion of classicality um, in, a, in a way that's, that's made rigorous. I'll also say, um, as an aside, it's difficult to see, at least for me, how to analyze general relativity according to these ideas. I haven't really figured out how to do, how to do it yet or whether one can do it yet. So how does one get from there to classical space-time structure? So in classical mechanics, I claim, evolution characterizes time in its geometry, while interaction, including isolation, characterizes space in its geometry. This is the, this make, what I'm about to, uh, the construction I'm about to show you makes precise what I said earlier, that, con that configuration encodes the possible interactions that the system can have with this environment. And both jointly determine the full four-dimensional flat affine geometry of what's, I guess, usually these days called Neo-Newtonian or Galilean space-time. So here's how the construction goes. Because the family of dynamical vector fields has the structure of an affine space, the dynamical evolutions, the interval curves of these vector fields have a natural affine parameterization. That determines, I claim, the temporal metric. The ratios of the lengths of different intervals on the same curve, on the same interval curve, is determined by the affine structure. The interactions determine configuration space, that's clear. Well, if you believe me, at least, I haven't given you the proof. But we need more than that. We need to, we need to show that um, it somehow encodes Euclidean R3, you know, uh, at the, the, uh, at, uh, all of space at a given moment of time in, in classical mechanics. So here's how, here's how um, one recovers that. At every point of configuration space, the tangent plane can be naturally identified with the free dynamical vector field. And that's because the system, um, the free dynamical vector field can be thought of as encoding the possibility of the systems moving freely in all possible directions at all possible, at all possible speeds. So, and that, but that just means every single point in the tangent plane is, uh, is a possible initial value, if you like, for the free for the free dynamical vector field, for the uh, for the free for the um, I, the isolation dynamical vector field, those velocity differences um, so the the velocity differences that are defined by the affine structure correspond to Galilean boosts, the family of which naturally has the structure in fact of Euclidean R three. Once you fix a zero point, which is done by say the frame of reference of the system that you that's naturally associated with the system that you're that you're dealing with. So then the free, the free vector field on the Newtonian space of states, in fact, it turns out induces an affine connection on the induced configuration space. At each point of configuration space, each tangent vector determines a unique geodesic, that one that lifts to one of the interval curves of the free vector field on, um, on the full space of states. It's easy to show that affine connection is flat. It projects down to a flat affine connection on the Euclidean R3 that you constructed previously from the Galilean boosts and is naturally identified with a canonical flat affine connection on Newtonian three space. Lee deriving this with respect to the free evolution vector field yields the canonical flat affine connection on four dimensional Newtonian space time. So knowing just these algebraic structures on the families of interaction vector fields and dynamical vector fields in the classical case, I have reconstructed the entire flat four-dimensional affine geometry of Neo-Newtonian and Galilean space-time. Um, I mean, in, in essence, what, what I'm doing is making rigorous the observations that Howard Stein made in 1967 in his, you know, uh, in his uh, 
classic paper, uh, The Structure of Newtonian Spacetime, uh, which captures uh, Newton's insight, according to Stein, that the dynamical structures framework encodes the spatiotemporal structure, encodes the spatiotemporal structure required to formulate his laws. So the distinction between time and space is built into the structure of the dynamics as is the geometry of space-time itself. And that just sums up what I said. I have a conjecture, which I'll throw out just because I, I, if it's true, it's, I, I think it'd be pretty cute which is that um, if you recall during the construction, um, I, um, I, defined an affine, I defined an affine structure on the, um, on the space of states by lifting the free dynamical vector field to the tangent bundle. That automatically gives me, a, that, that guarantees that the, that, the constructed af, that the constructed affine structure is flat, but I can equally well define an affine structure on the, on the tangent bundle of a configuration space by lifting any vector, any dynamical vector field. Generically, those will not be flat affine structures. And I conjecture, in fact, that all the different affine structures you get by lifting all the different um, dynamical vector fields, at least all the conservative ones, the ones that conserve energy, um, I think they're all equivalent in the sense that they yield the same geometrized Newtonian, gra um, geometrized Newtonian gravity spacetime or um, Newton Cartan spacetime, I guess, or sometimes called. In other words, they're all in the same equivalence class in the sense of Troutman. But if you don't know anything about what, I'm what I just said, don't worry about it. But I think, I, think it's, I think this is true and I think it'd be really cute if it were. So let's talk about interaction and evolution in Hamiltonian mechanics. When we can do this now very briefly that I've gotten all, all, almost all the heavy lifting has actually been done because the contrast now between the situation in classical and Lagrangian mechanics, will, uh, the contrast between that and the situation in Hamiltonian mechanics, and then the contrast with, uh, between that and the situation in quantum mechanics, I think is, will now be very, I hope will be very clear. So in Hamiltonian mechanics, phase space, space of states is a symplectic manifold as I mentioned before. But now the family of dynamical vector fields no longer has the structure of an affine space. It has rather the structure of a Lie algebra, which is formed from solving Hamilton's equation for all possible Hamiltonians formulated using the symplectic structure on the, on the space of states. The only fixed relations between Qs and Ps, what we like to think of as configurational momentum, are the canonical Poisson brackets Note that, though, that these are symmetric in the sense that Q and P enter them symmetrically. If I just, if I just give you Hamilton's equation, if, if, I tell, if, I, if I tell you how to solve Hamilton's equation, if I, if I, if I tell you the mapping between any, scale, any, any scalar function on the space of states and a vector field that is the dynamical vector field that is the result of solving Hamilton's equation for that scalar function, and I give you the Qs and Ps and the canonical Poisson brackets, you cannot tell me which are the Qs and which are the Ps. You can't tell me what's configuration, what's momentum. Everything is completely symmetric with regard to how they enter the dynamics. And one sign of this is that we have lost the distinction between evolution and interaction in Hamilton mechanics. Because the only thing one can mean by interaction is adding another Hamiltonian. In other words, the family of dynamical vector fields is the same as the family of interaction vector fields. Recall that there, there was no overlap whatsoever. The, there was, the, there's no intersection whatsoever between the, the dynamical vector fields and the interaction vector fields in the classical and the Lagrangian case. They are, they are completely disjoint families of vector fields. Here they are identical families of vector fields. There's a theorem that captures the sense in which um, Hamilton's that captures the sense in which ha, uh, you you can't get what you want, or at least what you had in the classical and the Grangian case here. Um, I don't think it's worth going through in detail because um, it's not important. The the technical details aren't important for our purposes. If you want to talk about it, um, please ask me during Q and A. I'll come back to it. But the, the important point for our purposes 
is that Hamiltonian mechanics is not a classical framework in my sense of classical, the one I, uh, I, the one I characterized earlier. The families of evolution and interaction vector fields are identical after the structure of a Lie algebra. Interaction is just adding another Hamiltonian. There is no principal distinction between configuration and momentum that you that you get from the dynamics itself. There's no distinction between them that's, that's intrinsic to the dynamics. In particular, the latter is not the dynamical derivative of the former, and the fixed relations between them are entirely symmetric. A fortiori, there is no naturally distinguished free evolution vector field. I can't tell you it's the vector field where only the configuration quantities change, because I don't know what the configuration quantities are. I mean, and the zero, the only one that I guess it's that is kind of picked out by the dynamics itself, because the you know, because the dynamical vector fields have the structure of a vector vector space, is the zero vector field. But that's not really a good candidate for free evolution. It's too degenerate. One wants to allow at least like constant changes to configuration for free evolution. So if I give you a manifold, I tell you how to formulate Hamilton's equation on it. So in other words, I give you a symplectic structure, you know, sabre voce. If I tell, i.e., if I tell you the structure of the dynamics, you can't tell me what's configuration and what's momentum. You can't. So in other words, you can't tell me what's space versus what's a temporal derivative. You can't distinguish interactions of evolutions. You can't tell me what is free what's free evolution, and you cannot reconstruct the structure of space time. You can't tell me how dynamics hooks up to the space time. But it is still the case. One still has a little bit of classicality here. Once I fix all that, if I just by fiat, by divine revelation, the who knows, if I tell you what 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 the configure what the Q's are and what the P's are, and I, I then and I tell you what the free evolution vector field is, then I can in fact still cleanly separate the system's degrees of freedom from those of its environments. I once again can ignore all the details of the environment's degrees of freedom, all the details of the environment's you know, nature as a physical system, treat it as a black box, because everything that's relevant to figuring, to determining the new, the new evolution of my Hamiltonian system under this interaction is encoded in the interaction Hamiltonian that I add to the free Hamiltonian. So why you might ask, does Hamiltonian mechanics work so well to model classical systems if as I claim, they're nothing, it's nothing at all like classical mechanics or Lagrangian mechanics. Well, because as I say, um, by fiat, we identify some variables as momentum. I mean, if, if, I give, if I give you configuration phase to start with, and then you do Hamilton mechanics on the cotangent bundle, which is, is probably what happens 99% of the time, that's exactly what I claim is happening here. You are starting out by telling me what configuration is. That tells me what, what momentum is. And then also, there's still a further step that is required even beyond that to ensure that, ha that Hamiltonian mechanics can be used to model classical systems well. And that's because we restrict attention only to Hamiltonians having a very special form, those that are purely quadratic in the momentum. No such restriction was required in the classical case. Although it turns out that you get weird behavior if you don't do that. But, um, more, more, more precisely, you get weird behavior in this. In, in the classical Lagrangian case, as long you can have any Lagrangian you want, as long as the as long as the Lagrangian doesn't um, give you an inconsistent, uh, doesn't yield an inconsistent Euler Lagrange equation, as I claim. In fact, so like you can have the Lagrangian L equals Q. That just gives you that gives you the identity zero equals zero. You can have the Lagrangian L equals Q dot. That gives you the inconsistent Euler Lagrange equation one equals zero. But pretty much anything else is fine. And anything else will give you a solution to the Euler Lagrange equation that has the fixed structure of a classical dynamical vector field where the, you can tell the Q's the V's apart and the V's are the dynamical derivatives of the Q and blah, blah, blah. But to get, to get that fixed relationship between the Q's and the P's we want, to have, to have the P's be in a certain sense, the dynamical derivatives of the Q's, we must, again, just by fiat, impose the restriction that Hamiltonians must have the special form of being purely quadratic in momentum. That reproduces the fixed kinematical relations between configuration and velocity in classical systems that we want. <clears throat> 
Um, it's, a, it's interesting to note, I mean, here's some, here some examples down here that, shows, that, that show you how things go wrong when you don't choose Hamiltonians that have that, have that particular form. And it's, uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of amusing to note that, whereas in, in a Lagrangian mechanics, L equals Q dot is a, is a strictly speaking inconsistent Lagrangian, as I say, it gives you, it yields the equation one equals zero. H equals P actually is a, is a perfectly consistent Hamiltonian. It gives you the weird uh, equation of motion, um, you know, Q dot equals one, but that's fine because that's H equals P is the Hamiltonian for a photon. So Hamiltonian mechanics is an odd no man's land. It shares features of both classical and quantum mechanics as we'll see. So there's no mathematical or conceptual distinction between interaction and evolution that one gets from the intrinsic structure of the dynamics alone. But there still is a clean separation of the system's degrees of freedom from those of the environment in the precise sense that I can turn on an interaction in scare quotes, since this is not in fact distinct from an evolution, I'm just adding a new Hamiltonian while treating the environment as a black box. Um, I'm gonna skip these in the interest of time. So you'll never know what they were. Uh, uh, the, if it comes up, it may come up during question and answer and then I'll go back to, I'll, I'll go back to them if that happens. So now we finally get to quantum mechanics. Here, the dynamical vector fields, the evolutions, are unitary flows on Hilbert space. Well, they're, they're, I, I'm glossing over several technical details and being a little loose, but again, one can make this all precise. The dynamical vector fields are the, you know, the tangent vectors tangent to unitary flows on Hilbert space. The unitary flows are themselves just exponentiated Hamiltonians. They're, they're self-adjoint operators, where the, the Hamiltonians are, uh, um, that, let's say, bounded self-adjoint operators. Interaction, again, as in the Hamiltonian mechanics case, is just adding another Hamiltonian. And the only fixed relations between configuration and momentum, analogous to the Hamiltonian case, is the canonical commutation relation, which again is completely symmetric between the Q and the P. The Q and the P enter it symmetrically. If, you, if, I, if I just give you a Hilbert space and its family of self-adjoint operators, i.e. I give you the dynamics, you can't tell me what's configuration and what's momentum. You can't distinguish the Qs from the Ps. You can't distinguish interactions from evolutions. You can't tell me what's free evolution. Indeed, even if I give you a standard Hamiltonian in some funky basis and ask you to decompose it into its free part and its interaction part, you won't be able to do it. If all you know is the space of states and the, and the structure of the dynamics. Moreover, in order to treat there, what I said was before, if you were paying close attention, you'll, you will have noticed that what I said, but what I said just one moment ago actually wasn't quite right. Interaction, strictly speaking, isn't in quantum mechanics, isn't, ad, isn't just adding another Hamiltonian. In order to represent an interaction in, in quantum mechanics, I need, it turns out, an explicit representation, both of the degrees of freedom of the environment and how they intertwine with those of the system in order to appropriately and adequately to fully treat the system during an interaction. More specifically, I need to change the space of states I used to treat the system. Now I'm, instead of having, instead of dealing just with the Hilbert space of the you know, um, of, the isol of, the system, of the isolated system, I have to deal with the tensor product of the system's Hilbert space with the, uh, with the um, Hilbert space of the environment. I have to change my set of physical quantities I'm dealing with because now I'm dealing, uh, now instead of dealing with the algebra of observables on the system's Hilbert space, I'm dealing with the algebra of observables on the tensor product Hilbert space. And I have to change the structure of the quantities that encode evolution because they're now Hamiltonians on the tensor product space, not on the so not on the system, not on the system's Hilbert space by itself. And so that most quantum of quantum mechanical phenomenon has now made its entrance entanglement. So there is an, in quantum mechanics, there's no clean separation 
between a system's degrees of freedom and those of its environment. If I want to understand how a system evolves under interaction with the environment, I have to know how to model the environment's degrees of freedoms and its dynamics. And this, this again, I realized when talking to Don a few years ago, that this is, this is a way, I think, to make precise and to capture his Don's reconstruction of Bohr's understanding of entanglement and his insistence on complementarity and quantum measurements. So as far as I'm concerned, I think Bohr was really onto something. And a lot of the Bohr bashing that is still common today is not warranted at all. Well, in quantum mechanics, the transition to non-classicality is complete. So how do we, in fact, distinguish the Qs and the Ps in quantum mechanics and so define a free evolution? Well, I claim there are two ways that we standardly do it in practice. One is just by fiat. I just give you a Hilbert space, I give you the self-known operators, and I say, and I, by, by, you know, up, by ostensive definition, those are the Qs and those are the Ps. Go have fun. Or I, if I'm a little more sophisticated, I will introduce a representation of the Poincaré or the Galilean group, depending on whether I'm doing you know, uh, classical or relativistic mechanics, a la Wigner. You know, define Q as the generator of the momentum, of the momentum translations, et cetera. In both cases, though, we must explicitly and by hand hook the dynamics up to the background space-time structure to get a principal distinction between configuration and momentum, and so define what we mean by free and interacting. We don't get it from the dynamics alone as we do in classical mechanics. So I'm, this is now just a piece of totally wild speculation. Uh, so perhaps the lesson here is that at bottom, there is in fact no real difference between Q and B in quantum mechanics, which perhaps would strongly suggest that quantum gravity should not be formulated in a three plus one framework. Or as I like to say, three plus one does not equal four in general relativity. And that is uh, something that is part and parcel of the slides I skipped over in the Ham at the end of the Hamiltonian section. So and again, if this comes up in questions, I'll go back to those slides. So where does this leave us? I don't know. Was the slide I used at this point in the talk when I gave it last month at Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. I'm happy to report I now have some incipient ideas. Um, and so I, I will begin by briefly discussing the forms of possible response I think one can take to the situation as I have sketched it. I think the possible responses fall into one of three uh, camps. One, we can modify quantum mechanics or we can look for an interpretation that makes the difference between evolution and interaction clear as in classical mechanics. This is I think implicitly the most common approach in most of the popular interp what are interpretations of quantum mechanics. Many worlds of the preferred basis, Bohm, GRW. I'm not entirely sure about some of the information theoretic approaches, um, whether they, whether they uh, do this. I suspect they do, but I don't feel like I have a good enough grip on them to really be sure. But what, what's happening in this first response in this first kind of response is that we are taking a distinction that is completely natural in classical mechanics and we are trying to shoehorn quantum mechanics into a conceptual framework that respects the distinction. We are trying to impose what seems to me a completely unnatural distinction on quantum mechanics, a, a distinction quantum mechanics itself does not want us to make. It doesn't give us the tools to make this distinction. A second, and that, that is why, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I'm, I don't think any of the popular interpretations or approaches really solves the measurement problem. A second, possible, a second possibility is to reconceptualize interaction in quantum mechanics so as to a, accord with the facts as I've laid them out. And I think that actually is what is done, as I'll remark on in a moment, by um, some of the, ver the very interesting work being done on indefinite causal structures by Bruckner and his group at 
Vienna and by Lucien Harding, and also in a way by um, Ravelli's um, relational quantum mechanics, I think also falls into this, into this camp. The third possibility, and this is one I don't, I don't know of anyone tr really trying to do this, is just get rid of the distinction between evolution and interaction altogether and just reconceptualize dynamics. That this is, this is if you like, the version of um, wait, wait, waiting for our Einstein to tell us uh, um, that we need to get rid of simultaneity altogether. So I'll, I will just say a, a few things very, very, very few and brief things um, about what I think are some possible connections to what, I, to what I've been talking about so far and the approaches to quantum theory that rely on indefinite causal orders um, like, like Lucien Harding's causal weight framework and Bruckner and his uh, collaborators process matrix formalism. And I have two conjectures about this, and they're only conjectures, and not ones that I, um, I'm not willing to go to the mats to defend these at all, because I, um, I really have been thinking, of, I only realized that, that there was a, this possible connection about a month ago, and I have not had time to really sit down and think it through carefully and thoroughly. So this really, I, these, this is a conjecture really much more in the spirit of Hey guys, let's go to the bar and have several beers, and I'll tell you this this crazy this crazy idea has had. Maybe it'll work out. So that's where my head's at right now. But you know, in, in in the spirit of hopefully getting some good feedback and telling me either why I'm wrong or giving me some direction about how to how to think about this better, I will I will lay this on you. So first con first conjecture is configuration and, mo and momentum are not naturally and uniquely distinguished by the uh, by the dynamics. Because different causal orders require different momentum, momentum operators to respect the different null cones when we're doing relative, when we're doing relativistic mechanics. So this, uh, this and although I actually I suppose the same is true in classical mechanics as well, because we still have the distinction between time-like and space-like vectors in the Newtonian space. So yeah, so configuration of momentum, in fact, so it's. It's, it's not just respecting the null cones, it's respecting the, um, the distinction between time and space. And I think that, again, one, I conjecture that one way to interpret a process matrix in Berkner et al's process matrix formulation, uh, form, formalism is as a fixing of the P's and Q's in the output Hilbert space. If you're not, so, if you're not familiar with these formalisms, um, I, I apologize. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm at the moment I'm speaking only to people who actually know who actually know this stuff. I don't have the time or space uh, to tell to really uh, tell you how how these frameworks work. So if you know about it, um, I hope that you're intrigued. If you don't know about it, I apologize and just ignore what I said. The, similarity, the similarities points of contact with Rivelli's relational quantum mechanics can be summed up by um, Carlo's slogan that properties of systems refer to interactions, not to system simplicity. And again, I would have uh, to, really, to really dive into why I think that this is a real point of contact, a real, a potentially a real and substantive point of contact with Carlo's uh, program would take me, it would be a, a full talk on its own to, to really lay out the system, the framework of relational quantum mechanics and spell out how, um, why I think that Carlo's notion of a property of a system as being encoded in an inter interaction, not in a system by itself, reflects the mathematical and conceptual facts that I've laid out. So I guess, what I'm invite, I will conclude by inviting you to join me and maybe live up to the dream of the logical empiricists and working together collegially, perhaps we can in mutual support, become our own Einstein together and figure out how to do away with the idea of interaction, the ideas of interaction and evolution and reconceptualize dynamics and therefore, thereby solve the measurement problem. That's my dream. Thank you. Jeremy. Uh, thank you, Antonio, and uh, thank you, Eric, for your wonderful talk. Uh, Eric, I, uh, I have two questions primarily, if I may. Uh, 
One is, have you thought about uh, Lagrangian field theory in the classical context and whether it's like your discussion of Lagrangian mechanics? And have you thought about whether the path integral is a formulation of quantum mechanics that suits your love of the Lagrangian? I have a second question, but I shouldn't hog, hog people's time. So um, I have in fact thought um, about, the, um, about the field theoretic uh, context. And in the, I actually was gonna just very briefly discuss Maxwell theory uh, in, um, in, the class, in the Lagrangian framework, but I decided not to just in, in the interest of time. So it turns out uh, to my mind, remarkably, like mind blowingly, uh, like everything I said about classical systems actually carries over to classical uh, field theories in, in the Lagrangian framework, although with, with, with a slight difference. So if, if you learned um, if you learned the Lagrangian formulation of um, of Maxwell theory um, in your bachelor's, as I did, and we're told that um, that uh, B is configuration and E is velocity, and you were completely baffled as I was, what, why that was. Well, um, I, I, actually, I actually now have an explanation uh, for, for why it is. It turns out that when you look at the Maxwell equations, the B fields, um, the equations for B are just like the equations for X dot equals B and the equations for E are just like the equations B dot equals F. So at least for Maxwell theory and for classical, uh, for classical field theories that are, not, that are close enough to Maxwell theory and um, everything I say works. Um, I have, for about the um, the path integral of formalism. I mean, I I claim that it suffers what I want to what I want to call the same flaw as the ordinary flat-footed non-relativistic quantum theory that I was treating in this talk, in that um, it 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 pre it presupposes. A distinction between configuration and let's, momentum is, is how it's usually formulated. Um, it, pre it presupposes a, a distinction between configuration and momentum. You have to hook up the dynamics to, to the underlying space-time structure by hand, uh, perhaps um, you know using something like a Wigner's technique. But it has the same intrinsic problem that there is no clear-cut distinction based on the internal structure of the dynamics of the theory alone between what one means by interaction and what one means by evolution. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think any, um, no, nothing is really gained, it turns out, in quantum field theory by, uh, by going to the path integral formulation, I think, with regard to the issues that, I, that I'm talking about here. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, Jeremy, if uh, uh, you are okay with that, I will call on you on the second round of questions. Thank for, you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So now it's uh, Alexei's turn. So, Alexei. Yes, thank you, Antonio. Uh, thanks, Eric, for, for this talk. So uh, let's uh, focus uh, for this particular question on the causal, uh, indefinite causal uh, orders uh, uh, idea. So maybe we could go to that slide. See. Yes. Um, so I think there's a very peculiar thing uh, happening, in, again, with apologies to those who don't know the framework. Uh, so let's assume uh, that people know what a process matrix formalism is. Uh, locally, for every uh, observer in the process matrix formalism, uh, there's a well-defined idea that there's a system entering the lab there's an input Hilbert space, and then at the exit, uh, the system goes out of the lab, if you like, uh, and there's a Hilbert space at the exit. And this is local for every observer. So in that sense, you can talk about P's and Q's of the evolution or interaction, whatever, within that laboratory. Now, there's a very peculiar mathematical operation happening here, which enables the process matrix approach, which is that you take a tensor product of all these Hilbert spaces across different observers who may have different uh, 
uh, time directions, different different ideas about causation and so on. Uh, so in that Hilbert space, uh, we're not talking about systems. It's a it's a very strange beast, which is not in which is not present in orthodox quantum mechanics. It's a Hilbert space not inhabited by physical systems. Physical systems make sense in these local Hilbert spaces of each observer, but in the big space, you can't even talk about systems. There's no notion of a system that lives in that space. So even talking about P's and Q's in that big Hilbert space doesn't make sense. You see, this is a little uh, jump, if you like, from uh, the orthodox quantum theory with its quantum systems that correspond to Hilbert spaces to the process matrix framework where we meet a Hilbert space not inhabited by physical systems. So here for me, the question becomes, um, what is that kind of physical theory that we're building with these mathematical tools that work, which is not about physical systems? So th th thank you, Alexa, that's, that's really great. The, um, so, According to the classification I gave of possible responses to the either problem or issue that I raised, depending on, on how you look at it, um, I actually take uh, these um, these frameworks to be a response of the third kind. Precise, it's exactly because of what you just said that the the, the grand Hilbert space is um, is not one that lends itself to interpretation as being the space of states of a physical system. We are, in fact, we're, we're, we're really getting rid of the distinction between evolution and interaction altogether, and we're reconceptualizing dynamics. Now, that's an easy thing for me to say, but to tell you exactly what it means as, as a way of thinking about it as a physical theory is, um, I, I don't know how to, I don't really have a satisfying answer for you. Because the only way, the only way I still know how to think about um, what's going on, say, in the process matrix formalism is still by thinking about the, the two separate laboratory, let, let's say in the, in the particular uh, setup that's usually usually considered, the two separate laboratories, each with their own definite causal, you know, uh, ca uh, causal ordering and each with their own P's and Q's and then playing around with superposing them in different ways. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know how to think about them in a way that's in, independent of that kind of decomposition. I personally, I personally feel like that is not a failing of the, at least not necessarily a failing of the process matrix framework. I feel like that is per possibly a failing of my own uh, conceptual scheme, which is, which is you know fr 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 from the top to the bottom, thor thoroughly permeated by these cl classical ideas of systems and interaction and evolution and P and Q. So I think that um, what, what, I, what I speculate is possible is to try to use these formalisms to construct a new, conce a new conceptual framework that doesn't rely on interaction, evolution, and dynamics in the, in the traditional classical sense, but that respects exactly the, the mathematical features that you're talking about, the, glo the, global, the global Hilbert space and the process matrix has. I don't, so I, I, I am 100% sure that you find that deeply dissatisfying. And I, I, I have to say I do as well, but I'm, that, that's why what I'm saying here is it's a conjecture for many reasons. Part, part of which is, I don't feel like I have a good enough grip conceptually on, the, on, these, on these frameworks to be confident that what I'm saying really can be mapped onto what they're saying. And then the further step to really understand what it is that they're saying. I think I have a, an idea of what they're saying, but I find it very hard to articulate as I, uh, I, I think you do as well. Yeah, so we can definitely continue, but maybe uh, later on that. Yeah. If, you have, uh, if you have a quick follow up, Alexei, you can, you can do that. So we don't- Yes, what I wanted to say, okay, let me add one phrase. Thank you, Antonio. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, even if I wrote uh, three years ago a paper about this idea of uh, physical theory not, not being about systems, I, I agree that I still, as you do, I, I'm still far from understanding this well. We're, we're still on this, uh, you know, we're moving in that direction, but we're far from having a satisfactory understanding. Um, I think that the, a very important thing here is uh, 
not so much P's and Q's, but the distinction between inputs and outputs. Um, you know, in an operational framework and process matrices are an operational framework. Uh, and um, that distinction has recently been challenged by Luz and Hardy. So the distinction between inputs and outputs is a um, very fundamental element of operational frameworks. Um, even if you don't talk about systems, you can still make that distinction. So once you've get once you you've got rid of, of P's and Q's and the idea that the space is inhabited by systems, you still can distinguish inputs and outputs. But now this has recently been challenged by Lucien Hardy, who put as you may know a hundred fifty page article on archive a couple of weeks ago, for for a theory which doesn't even have that distinction between inputs and outputs. It goes even further, and um, that is. I think one of the roads that may lead us to this collective Einsteinian revolution, as you say. So that's the end of my extra comment. Thank you again. And um, I, I will I will say in response to that. So yeah, I saw I, I saw that Lushkin had posted that. I have not even I have not even downloaded it. I'm too scared. I, I just I I I I don't have the time or the or like the bandwidth right now to deal with it. I'm still trying to figure this stuff out. So, but I, I, I do plan uh, eventually to get to it. But the, um, but the point, the, the, the other point, the first point you made is very well taken uh, that what's fundamental in the, in the process matrix formalism at least is the distinction between input and output, not the distinct, not, it, it's not the reliance on the more traditional physical quantities like position, momentum, energy. And that's exactly why I have number two here as a conjecture because I have to figure out a way to translate P's and P and Q talk into input output talk in order to see if what I'm saying re really makes sense. If, 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 if the way that I'm trying to think about the process matrix really does justice to what the process matrix formalism is trying to tell us. Thanks. Next in line, we have Hans Oettinger. Hans, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, th thank you for this. Um, very interesting and challenging presentation. I mean, it, it made us think, I guess. Um, I, I must admit that until an hour ago, I was of the naive opinion that Hamiltonian and Lagrangian frameworks are equivalent, and now I'm irritated. Um, so I have three little issues which I would like to, to put accomplish. on the map so that I better understand. And the one is the role of variational principles. If I look in this context, which you're discussing at variational principles, which kind of encode the, 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 lead, the, the, the Poisson bracket structure, um, how, how does that change the picture? Then you looked at deterministic systems, at reversible systems. If I put a little bit of, of dissipation in there, that might change the picture also entirely because dissipation usually goes to the highest derivatives and so they are distinguished. And the third thing is, of course, we, you, you were relying on differential equations and so on continuous trajectories in particular. And for quantum mechanics, my feeling would be that interactions have something to do with jumps um, between different states. Yeah? So is, is continuous versus jumps some possibility to, to, to make a separation between free evolution and interaction and these things? Th those were the three issues which would help me to clarify what you said. Okay, let, let's let's see. So the first one, um, the uh, the variational principles. So the reason why, so it, it turns out that if you um, if you look at the way the very the variational principles are formulated, the so the the variational principle, for instance, um, that that leads you to the to the Euler Lagrange equation. You have, you have the action. You 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 vary the action over paths. This leads you to. Um, through the standard mathematical the, the, the standard mathematical moves, uh, you, you you get the, the Euler Lagrange equation as the equation as the equation that must be satisfied in order for the action to be a stationary point, um, you know, of the, um, of of the of the variational integral. The that it turns out that what what's always like ninety nine percent of the time what's happening behind the scenes that is not actually um, 
it's, it's been, well, it's being assumed, but it's never, it's almost never made explicit that it's being assumed. Is that you're on it? Um, is that the variations that you are allowing yourself are constrained? You, you can't if you just um, write down a very if you just write down a variational problem, and um, you know, let's say I, I'm going I'm going uh, I'm going to consider all very all variations in all possible directions on um, on on my on my functional space. You'll get the trivial. You'll the only the only the only answer in general will be the trivial the trivial solution zero equals zero. You have to constrain the the directions in which you are in which you're um, taking your variational derivatives, and it turns out that in the classical case, and um, in the case where you um, you uh, you know write, write down Hamilton, you, you write down Hamilton, you use Hamilton's principle to derive the euler lagrange equation. That con the constraints on the possible directions that you are allowed to vary in are exactly the classical constraints of v equal you know uh, x dot equals v. You, you, the variations you're allowing yourself that you have to restrict yourself to in order to get a well-posed variational problem in the first place have assumed the fixed kinematical relations between position and velocity that characterizes Newtonian mechanics and Lagrangian mechanics. In the Legendre transform uh, to move to Hamiltonian mechanics, you lose um, you lose that you lose that fixed kinematical relationship uh, between the two. So that actually leads um, into I think an, um, a way to try to address your second question about so the second question was about dissipation, right? Right. Yeah. So um, it, you can't really um, I mean it, in the in the standard flat-footed Hamiltonian mechanics uh, framework you can't. Um, represent dissipative systems because energy is trivially conserved. If you, if by energy you mean the Hamiltonian function, well, trivially the Hamiltonian function is conserved along all, along all the interval curves of every Hamiltonian vector field. So you might want to say, well, I, if I let, let, let's think about um, a, a particle, you know, like a, a little a little particle on a spring that's vibrating in a viscous fluid as my dissipative system, and so the kind of uh, the kind of naive thing you want to write down in Hamilton mechanics to, to, to represent that is going to be exactly this. You know, the one half p squared plus one half q squared is the simple harmonic part, and then the plus p is the is the is the is the viscous dissipative term. But of course, that doesn't really represent a dissipative system because um, you know the Hamiltonian is still conserved. There's no, there's no dissipation, but it is a non-classical system because. V no longer equals Q dot, V equals Q dot plus one under the Legendre transform. And I don't, I don't even know what that means physically. But of course you can represent dissipative systems in the Lagrangian, in the Lagrangian uh, framework. In fact, one half V squared plus one half Q squared plus a V is a perfectly well-defined Lagrangian, which gives you exactly the right equations of motion for a damped simple harmonic oscillator. And, uh, Energy isn't conserved, and everything works out great. So uh, the Lagrangian and Lagrangian Hamiltonian mechanics really are ra radically different frameworks, which I think is not emphasized enough when they're when they are presented to poor hapless bachelor students like I was. Wow, I was just so incredibly confused. Question just on that point. I mean, you assume that I don't change the Hamiltonian description if I stay on the PQ space. Um, that that should be changed if I want to treat uh, dissipative systems. Huh? So it, it it was not a remark that you should keep the Hamiltonian structure exactly as it is. You have to add something, but you could still do it on the PQ space, which was the issue, right? I mean that that in the PQ space you have lost something, and I think at the moment where you have to do the additional thing to introduce dissipation, you have to to say something about that and to move away from purely Hamiltonian, so that yeah. there's a little bit more structure in there. Which then starts to make distinction between Q and P. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but again, the structure that you're going to be putting in is exact is exactly the, I claim the structure that you need to distinguish your Qs from your Ps in a way that's intrinsic to the dynamics. So yeah, of course, of course you can do that, and that's in fact what people do, and that's why Hamilton mechanics is so incredibly successful. It, it's so incredibly useful. At modeling classical systems, because we import all this stuff by hand and and impose the, these external constraints on Hamiltonians and um, on and uh, additional structure besides this inflectic structure that gives 
the very, very generalized Hamilton framework, it's, it's extraordinary expressive and representational power. But just Hamilton mechanics by itself, as you know, in, 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 the, in, the sim, in the simplest, most bare bones form, gives you none of that. The third question you had was about um, interactions being uh, represented or possibly being related to jumps. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think GRW is a, is, a, is a great example of that. This is, I believe, I think I mentioned that here, yes. So to me, um, that, that, that is a perfectly legitimate um, po uh, what, uh, po possibility to try to solve you know, the measurement problem and to try to solve all the conceptual puzzles that quantum mechanics seems to, seems to present to us. And I don't want to, by any means, denigrate it or, um, or just dismiss it out of hand as you know, some contemptible option. It's not, it's uh, you know, GRW and related theories are, are really quite extraordinary in what, they're, in what they're able to achieve and how they're able to, to recapitulate the deterministic Schrodinger evolution, you know, with, the, with these stochastic jumps. I, th I, I think it's, it's very beautiful. Um, my, my, my feeling, my, and this is now really nothing more than if you like a gut feeling, but it's a very strong one I have. I still don't like it because it's, it's trying to make quantum mechanics look classical. And the world, uh, you know, if the world really is quantum, then I think it, it just can't be right. In some, we're, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what, what the modal force of that can't is, but there's some modal force there, by God. It just, it can't be right to try and shoehorn force quantum mechanics to fit the, the shackles of our classical concepts. That, that, just, that just doesn't smell right to me. That, that's not how we're gonna solve the, pro the problems that quantum mechanics presents us with. We have to listen to quantum mechanics and figure out what concepts it is trying to tell us are the natural right ones to, interp to interpret it with. I, I, as I'm sure you recognize, I did not give you an argument in any, in any sense of the word there. It was, a, it was an exhortation, if you like. Thanks for the additional information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next hand that I see is from uh, Tony Sudbury. Tony, please go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Eric, for a very interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking talk. Uh, I wonder if you're familiar with the mad dog Ever Everettianism of, um, of Sean Carroll, which I, I have only a very superficial acquaintance with, but I think is uh, another way of addressing your problem that's on the screen at the moment. Um, yes, yeah, so a, a response to this problem, essentially the problem of the unitary symmetry of quantum mechanics, that there is no difference between one state and another and no difference between uh, the Q operators and the P operators. You need something extra to get that difference. And uh, Carroll's idea is that, well, there is something that's given to us in the world and that is a particular Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian of, of the real world, and uh, the the uh, the hope, the uh, speculation, is that in the purely in the, the uh, spectrum of that Hamiltonian, there is enough information to recover the identity of Qs and Ps, for example, even to recover the dimensionality of space time. Uh, do do you think of that as a a, a possible approach to this problem? Um, absolutely, I think it is a possible one. Um, it's it, again, it's it, it's one that I'm it's one that I'm not comfortable with for many reasons. But the one that's most relevant to uh, to, to what to what I've been saying in this talk is that. Um, I, so I, I I guess I'll, I'll take a step back and say first of all, I think it's it's got to be right. I mean, almost trivially, that whatever else is the case, however you understand quantum mechanics in the end. You have to be able to explain the fact that in the class in the world we actually inhabit, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, at, in the in the mesoscopic world, we know we, we know what configuration is. We know, we know we know what momentum is. We know how to distinguish them physically, and we our physical theories we employ them to do that. You know, it just works like gangbusters. It's incredibly successful how we do that. So what whatever whatever story you're, you're going to tell about quantum mechanics, you have, the story has to include 
as a minimal condition, as a minimal you know, condition of consistency, that we that we be able to recover this fact about how we live in the mesoscopic world and how we you know, uh, reason physically about the mesoscopic world. And there's a sense, there there is a, some sense in which I think Sean's story a lot. The, the, I, I think if you view Sean's story as telling you how to recover from a, from the class from the classical theory, the I'm sorry, from the quantum theory, the classical picture, then I think what Sean is up to and other, I like your phrase, mad, mad dog Everettians, uh, is, is an approach to addressing this question. But the reason why um, I don't like it is because he, he, he seems to be, a, a, again, he's, I see no reason whatsoever why we ought to assume that at, at, a, at a very deeper fundamental level, the Hamiltonian is such as to encode this, what I claim is a purely classical distinction. I, I think it absolutely must be the case that, so, that some deep, deep, you know, deep fundamental Hamiltonian, if that really is the way that the, you know, the, the world would be described that, um, at, at, at some fundamental level, we have to be able to show that in, in, an, appro in an appropriate approxim approximative or, or idealizing limit, we recover something like a Hamiltonian whose spectrum you know, gives us these, this classical distinction. But I don't see why we should assume that that's, that, that you know, we get, class, we get you know, classically distinguishing spectrum of Hamiltonian all the way down. That again, seems to me to be a, a completely unwarranted and far too strong assumption. Can I comment on that? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the point is, it's, it's not an assumption about the way the world is. It's a hope. Uh, uh, for what we might be able to reconstruct. So it's, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you're saying you think it's mathematically implausible that that would be possible with any particular spectrum, I think that's a reasonable point of view, but, but it's not a good reason for not trying. Oh, no, I, um, I, I don't, I, I would never make that claim. I don't, I don't, I think that the, you know, that, the world of possible Hamiltonians is pretty wild and woolly. I, I mathematically, I, I would, I would not dream of saying that it's implausible that we couldn't find one that would, that that would allow us to, re, allow us to, re, uh, to recover the right, the right classical structure. I would, I would, I would honestly be shocked if there weren't such Hamiltonians out there. And that God chose it for the world. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Now it's uh, Joanna Lutz's turn. So, Joanna, please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I have a clarificatory question. Uh, so, I didn't understand why did you claim that um, one of the differences between quantum and classical case is that in the former we need to represent the degrees of freedom of the environment explicitly. And my problem with this um, comes from the fact that physicists uh, sometimes consider um, models of quantum particles in uh, an external potential, which seems to be exactly the case where um, environment influences our system, but we don't need to model it explicitly. And such models would be unsuitable if we wanted um, to model how the environment changes um, as a result of the influence of the system on the environment. Uh, and then we need to model environment degrees of freedom explicitly. But then I don't see why does this differ with the classical case? Because in the classical case, sometimes we need to model environments, degrees of freedom explicitly as well. Uh, th thank you, that's a really good question. So the, the difference is that in quantum mechanics, so you're, you're absolutely right. It, um, it, it's a very common computational practice to, to, um, to when you're writing down the Hamiltonian for, for a, a quantum system, just to write down, to, to just, a, just a slap on some potential to the free Hamiltonian and say, and, and just, you stay, stay on your system Hilbert space and, and, and look at the unitary flows. 
but I, I claim that that is, well, that, that works, you know, that, that works great a lot of the time. It won't, it does, it's not really giving you the dynamics of the system because you're ignoring, you're ignoring, you're necessarily ignoring the entanglement, the entanglement between the system you're studying and the environment. And so you are in fact, you, you by doing that, you're, you are, you are implicitly saying there are certain physical questions I'm not allowing myself to ask about the physical system by using this representation. There are certain dynamical questions about the physical system I, I am not able to answer using, the, using this representation. That's not true in the classical case. In the classical case, when I give you the interaction, when I impose, when I write down the interaction vector field on the classical space of states, I can ask and answer every single possible dynamical question about the system. But I cannot do that in the quantum case. I'm rule it when I when I use the calculational device that that you mentioned. I'm ruling out the possibility of asking and answering any questions about the system's entanglement with the environment. To answer those questions, I need to write down the tensor product Hilbert space and write the Hamiltonian and use the Hamiltonian use a Hamiltonian that is an operator on the tensor product Hilbert space. That's why I claim that in order uh, that that that's what I mean when I so that in if you care about only a subset of dynamical questions, then you can do then you can do exactly what you say. But if you want to recover, if you like the full the full possible spectrum of dynamical information, you must use you you can't you can't ignore the details of the nature of the degrees of freedom of the environment and and um, and their dynamics. Thank you. Thanks. Next in line, we have uh, Carlo Rovelli. Carlo, please go ahead. Um, I thank you, uh, uh, Antonio. Hi, Eric. Um, Hi, I have a, just a, a short finger on uh, <clears throat> the a previous exchange on uh, the mad dog veritanism. I think Tony raised it uh, by, by Sean Carroll and his uh, collaborator. And then a short question to you. The, the finger is that, uh, um, uh, uh, what Carol is trying to do is to uh, assume that there is an Hamiltonian and read out from its spectrum, which is the only invariant thing uh, in his context, uh, because it, it is, I have only the Hilbert space and Hamiltonian. <clears throat> um, the Hamiltonian. The, 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 the breaking of the Hilbert space in subsystems, and this is generically possible. Uh, However, I think Sharon recognizes that as a fundamental description of the world, this doesn't work because uh, in a in a in a covariant theory, which is how we think the world is, uh, there's no Hamiltonian. There is a Hamiltonian constraint, and if you try to play that game with a Hamiltonian constraint, it doesn't work. Um, so uh, this, I, I I don't think this can be can be thought as a general solution of that, unless one find a solution to this kind of problem. Uh, the question to you, Eric, it's, uh, it might be a, a silly question. Please tell me, uh, Carlos, shut up, because uh, I missed a, a part of the talk, of your talk, unfortunately, I had to go. So if you, if you have said already, I apologize, and then you know, we, we, we'll change mail. Uh, there's one point, you insisted at length about distinction between Qs and Ps. Yeah. There's one something. Uh, but uh, what about the actual systems where physically we, we don't know which are the Qs and Ps. And I think if, for instance, electromagnetism is one of the best classical system we have uh, and, and that most describe the world, electromagnetism, uh, you have, you know, canonical commutation between E and B, but who is, who is Q and who is P is just uh, arbitrary. Or I'm thinking about uh, anything that rotates, uh, either is a classical rotator or an electron, which you, you, you don't have a little stone and, and you, have, you have angular momentum, you have a perfect, uh, um, a perfect uh, Hamiltonian description, but but uh, you can play the game with Q and P differently, and uh, and uh, it doesn't seem to be physically significant. So in other words, my, when I studied Hamiltonian and then in, in its physical application, I thought that this was genuinely a more general and, and properly so way of, of of viewing how nature works. That's but but that's I, I'm not sure. I'm, that in a different direction of what you're, where you're going to. So um, I, I claim that at least for at least for classical systems. So let, let's ignore let's ignore uh, quantum mechanics for a minute. 
at least for classical systems, all the classical systems that we actually know of, I claim there is, there is a way of telling what the Q's are and what the P's are. And so um, here, here you, uh, you can get a sense of it by looking at um, the, Ma the Maxwell equation. So the free field Maxwell equations are, we, we all know and love these, the components of, um, of the dynamical vector field in an appropriate uh, coordinate system, coordinatized by, fun by, you know, by, by, the, by, the, by the E's and the B's are this. Now, whoops, what are the allowed interactions? The only allowed interactions are turning, are introducing some charge and turning on some current. That changes only these two equations. These two equations don't change. So in a, the, the dynamical vector field is now this. And if you subtract, and it turns out that once again, this, it turns out quite miraculously to my mind, this really is a classical system in my sense. The dynamical vector, the interaction vector fields still form a vector space. The dynamical vector fields form an affine space modeled on that vector space. And that tells you that the, B, that the Bs are configuration and the Es are velocity. And the, the, this trick, if you like this, I mean, I don't know what to call it. It's kind of miraculous. This works for every single classical theory I know of. And you can do it with angular, angular, angular momentum, angular velocity as well. But this doesn't work in, for all quantum theories. And, and, there, and there, because of that, I think that the, the only way I know how to tell the difference between the Q's and the P's in quantum theory is when the quantum theory arises, uh, if you like, I mean, tur it turns things on its head really, but this is the way we always talk and think. The quantum theory arises by quantizing the classical theory. Then I know what the Q's and the P's are. If there's a quantum theory that doesn't arise by quantizing the classical theory, then I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure what story to tell or whether we should in fact tell a story about that. The that's clarifies now. So you, so you, yeah, I see. So you think this is always possible in the classical theory? In, in, in those, all the, in, in all the in ones the classical I know theories, we, yeah, in the classical theories, we, 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 we describe the world and, and, and we know how to have them interact with something else. Yeah. It's to, to me, it's, it, it's almost magical how it works in the classical theory. And it just, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Eric, uh, you showed a, uh, a slide with a wild speculation on that. It, yes. it struck me because uh, you distinguished, uh, you know, conjectures, or speculations, wild speculations. Okay. Um, so that I just want to focus on these uh, um, uh, this, uh, first uh, um, two lines. Mm -hmm. um, so um, why should we speculate that? Can we speculate that instead, uh, the fact that we cannot see any real difference between uh, Q and P's uh, uh, besides, uh, let's say some, something by fiat uh, is because uh, the theory is basically a recipe for uh, uh, getting, uh, let's say empirical predictions and nothing more. So we need to supplement it with uh, some other piece of story in order to get to a real difference uh, uh, that is not, uh, let's say, uh, by fiat. Does this uh, sound to you as a wilder speculation than the one that you have proposed? Certainly not. That actually uh, strikes me as, um, as a much more tame speculation, I, I think, than the, than the one I'm proposing. And uh, in, in many ways, I mean, I, 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 I take it that's the kind of thing that Richard Healy would say and that you know, Chris Fuchs would say. And um, I guess, and I, I, don't, I don't have any, I don't have any knock-on arguments um, against that way of thinking about it. It's not one that I'm personally drawn to um, because, I, because I feel like it, I mean, I, I, again, I, I, can't, I can't give you an argument. I can only give you my, uh, kind of my, my gut feeling here. Which is that it's it's a cop out. It's I I feel like we're learning something about the I I, I am not a realist uh, in, uh, by most kind of standard philosophical uh, account you know uh, scientific accounts the the way that realism is usually cashed out in, in philosophy of science today I, I'm not a realist but I still think nonetheless that our theory our our best theories are really teaching us something deep and important about the world. And I think that 
going, I think that going in the kind of direction that you are, uh, that you're pointing to is to, is to do science and ourselves a disservice. It's, it's to say we, and we have reached a point where we can, where we no longer should treat our physical theories as telling us something about the world. Our physical theories are now only telling us how to predict, how to predict and, manip and manipulate the world. That may, that may in fact be right. We may in fact have reached that point in, in our epistemic development. But I don't want to give up, to, I, I don't want to give up just yet. I don't want to give up on the idea that our physical theories are teaching us something about the world and not just our capacities for predicting and, and controlling the world. No, okay, just, just a quick follow up. Um, I, I, I think that your reading is, is a bit too strong because uh, I, I can put forward this tamed speculation and still be a realist and totally agree to what you say that uh, um, scientific theories uh, tell us something about, about the world. Uh, we can, for example, just uh, say that uh, quantum mechanics as it is, is not exactly a physical theory. So we, in, in a sense, we want to place uh, uh, stronger constraints on what a physical theory really is. Uh, think about uh, Tim Maudlin's uh, uh, characterization of, of a theory uh, that he puts forward, for example, in his uh, latest book uh, on quantum mechanics. So a, a physical theory has to tell us uh, what is the ontology of the world uh, and, and stuff like that. Now, we, without going to this uh, extent, but still we may expect more from a theory than just uh, what quantum mechanics gives us. And in this sense, we may not consider it as a full-fledged theory. I don't know your thoughts. Well, so that, that's, that's, you put your finger on one of the reasons why I wouldn't consider myself a realist by um, almost, or maybe more accurately, why most philosophers of science would not consider me a realist. Uh, because I, I actually don't think ontology has, I don't think ontology plays any important role in our understanding of physical theories and how it maps onto the world at all. I think um, uh, that, I, I think that the, the desire to have um, a, a pristine ontology, in fact, again, that's another, that's another holdover from classical physics. What, the, the way that physical theory teaches us things about the world and gives us insight into how the world works is not by present, is, is not by allowing us to construct a pristine ontology. It's hard for me to tell you a story about what exactly it does do that allows us to learn things about the world, but it's not that. And so that, that's why I, so it sounds like you and I perhaps are, are closer in agreement here than it might have sounded like initially. Because uh, if, if all you're saying is, well, well, actually now I'm not sure. So if, why would you, well, it's, it now sounds to me, if I understand what you're saying, that it's not really inconsistent with how you just how you described uh, approaching the issue with my wild speculation that there is no real difference between being Q and being quantum mechanics. So do, do you think that what you're saying is actually inconsistent with this wild speculation? Because it actually seems to me that the two might go together. What I'm saying is that uh, the, the fa so we are drawing a conclusion uh, from something, so this is basically a non sequitur uh, okay. because uh, we are using just a recipe to draw conclusions about the world. Okay. Instead, we have yeah. to demand more from our antecedent, okay? And from that, we can draw. A yeah, and I, I, I guess you and I will part ways then because, uh, because I, 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 don't, I don't see quantum mechanics as being just a recipe for making predictions and for allowing and for telling us how to control things. I think it's a very beautiful and deep theory that should, we should try as, as, we should try as hard and long as possible to try to understand it as telling us something about the world and not just as a recipe book. Okay, so we can part ways, but please let's stay in touch. Absolutely. I have a finger on that, is that? Yeah. Yes, Carlo, Carlo, go ahead. But not if there's other people, should I go ahead? Um, well, uh, uh, once again, please, Eric, remember that I missed a piece of your talk. Um, I, I, I want to comment about this, this very nice exchange uh, you had with uh, 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 right now. Um, 
uh, let me put it in, in, in this way. First of all, I, I'm sympathetic a lot with your position uh, in which you, uh, in which you're, you're, you're realist, but not too much. Uh, I'm enormously sympathetic. I want to not talk about the world, not what I can say about the world. And at the same time, uh, when I talk about primitive ontology, uh, we're careful. I mean, we, we, we might, uh, or when I talk about um, system, how they are independent of interaction, careful. We might, we might be not using the right way of talking about the external world. Having said so, so we are, we are close there. What you present here as a wild speculation, and that's is my comment, uh, I would consider as my, uh, the way I understand physics, awesome. not wild speculation. Uh, so I, uh, I, I teach my students that in quantum mechanics, the distinction between Q and P is meaningless. Um, and the second step, I do believe that uh, three plus one uh, in quantum gravity is a wrong framework. It, it can be a right framework just as a, as, as a ladder to build something, uh, but it cannot be the cannot be the story uh, because uh, I mean you can you can break, break Lorentz invariance, choose a, choose a, and then call this time, and but then you know that you have to get out from this breaking. Um, and uh, but the point where I'm going is that uh, in quantum gravity, uh, I don't use a three plus one framework. I, I, I use regions which are have a boundary, and on the boundary is what we are talking about. And what happens to the boundary is, is, is uh, characterized by how the system interacts with something else. Mm -hmm. So the point is not Q and P. The point is that uh, the, degree, the degrees of view of the system and how they couple to something that uh, the thing in quantum mechanics we call, we measure them, but I would prefer uh, other system interact with. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just telling you the way I, I think about that. Are we much closer than in, 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 in what I say, I've said so far than, than I suspected originally? Yes, I, th um, I think we are. And um, I, exactly. I, I didn't see this slide, sorry. Um, I, th I, th I think we are, I think in fact, we are uh, really quite close on this. And, and so, that, uh, so yeah, I, I will just say, I, I, I completely endorse what you just said. Okay. And, um, and in fact, one, one of the, uh, besides, uh, try, besides trying to think about how um, the work I've done so far relates to the indefinite causal order uh, frameworks, I also think, as this slide suggests, I think that there's actually, that there's potentially a very interesting relationship between this stuff and your own relational view. And that's something that I, um, that I plan to think about and work on. So I'll probably, be, I'll, pro I'll probably be hitting you up with some questions by email pretty soon. Just warning you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for this very nice ex exchange. Uh, so um, are there any further questions? I think we can uh, open the floor for a second round of questions. So even people who have already asked something can raise their hands. So uh, uh, if there are no further questions, oh, okay, Davide, Davide Romano has a question. Davide, go ahead. Davide? Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Antonio. Uh, my question is, uh, given the framework that uh, you have sketched in the, in the presentation, uh, how much you are willing to take of the story of the coherence for the emergence of the classical world? In the sense that, you know, all the story of the coherence is based on interaction and uh, a position that emerges privileged variable from the Hamiltonian interaction. And it seems that you want to deny both of these aspects. So the, <laughs> the interaction is problematic in the first place and there is no distinction between position and momentum. Uh, so yes, the, the question finally is like, uh, uh, do you want to take some part of this story or you want to reject this? Uh, what, what is in, in your framework, the relation between classical and quantum mechanics? That's a really that's a really good question. Thank you. I, th I think it's a really hard question. I can say a little bit about it, which is that um, to me, um, when when decoherence 
um, works as a convincing story, it's because the quantum system, it's because the, we already know how to describe the quantum system in more or less classical terms to start with. So th th this relates to what I was saying to Carlo um, a, few moment, a, a few minutes ago, that I, 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 know how to, I know how to distinguish Q and P, I know how to talk about interaction when I'm dealing with a, with a quantum theory that arises, so to speak, by quantizing a classical theory. Um, I, I, how, how, does, how, how is uh, D coherence supposed to work for QCD? I, 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 I have no idea. So if we're dealing if, if we're dealing with a with a quantum theory that doesn't that doesn't already have a significant amount of contact with the classical world the classical concepts I think decoherence de de is great it um, it actually is really quite explanatory and um, and seems to provide us um, um, the mechanism we need but on, but but only to me in, in in very restricted very restricted circumstances where we already have all the machinery available that we need I see. if we don't have it then it's not it's not clear to me at all how it's supposed to work. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. OK, thanks. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, so Eric, very quickly, uh, I know that you don't like uh, to, to talk too much about uh, metaphysics, ontology, and, and the like. Uh, but are you? aware that the uh, theorems you have proven at the beginning of uh, the talk uh, can be used uh, by, let's say, relationalists uh, with respect to space and time uh, or uh, people who work in the dynamical approach uh, to endorse uh, their positions. So basically, you are doing also some metaphysical work there. So um, I would say that, in fact, it's not that I don't like talking about metaphysics. In fact, I think I'm a metaphysician. I think I'm a metaphysician in the tradition of metaphysics that traces back through Maxwell and Locke and Newton and Descartes going back. You know, um, I, I'm, I am trying to figure out how our best scientific knowledge, what that tells us about the nature of the world. I'm just, uh, I, but I, so I think what I do is metaphysics. I just, think that what a lot of other people do who say they're doing metaphysics, I don't recognize it as metaphysics because I don't see the contact with scientific knowledge. I don't see the grounding in scientific knowledge. So I would say, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right.